Until a more effective drug or vaccine is found, the main weapon we have against the spread of AIDS is education. If the parents are saying, my God, don't talk to my daughter about sex, I'm not, I'm talking about saving her life. We laughed and joked and we just had to because the next phone call was gonna be, someone else has died. This wasn't isolated anymore to them. It was, it was us. In the last year alone, more than 100 men, women, and children have died of AIDS in Kansas City. Brian White, he was a preteen when he contracted HIV, and that was through a blood transfusion. But he became a poster child because, you know, his family had to move, they were ostracized from their community. The strength and the endurance and of just saying, I'm just a kid and it's an illness. It, was the beginning, I feel like, of the shift away from, oh, this is only affecting gay white men. The Good Samaritan House has provided direct care for dozens of men and women with AIDS. Since 1985, it's been a stopgap hospice for area hospitals and nursing homes. The Good Samaritan Project says it can't find government funding for that $100,000 a year AIDS hospice. Instead, those government funds have been channeled into AIDS testing and education. In the spring of 88, Virginia announced that they didn't have the money to keep the hospice open, so they were going to close it. We'd opened Samaritan House and it wasn't licensed, and the costs of it were overriding every other program that we had, and we had so many programs. We were in danger of losing the entire program to the house alone, and the house could provide services for five people. But the project had, I don't even remember, well over a thousand clients, whether it was parents or siblings or the person infected. So the board decided that we had to close Samaritan House. And it was, as you might imagine, an extremely unpopular decision in the community. Because this was out of the blue, and it was the only place for people to go who were sick, who didn't have a place to live. So Sandy Berkeley, the wife of the Kansas City Mayor Richard Berkeley, stepped in and secured $100,000 in funding to keep the house open. Part of the stipulation of this money was that the hospice had to break away from GSP and become its own separate entity. AIDS patients in Kansas City will keep their home. We've told you about the problems at the Good Samaritan House. Well, tonight, some of those problems are solved. And Peggy Bright is in our newsroom with the story. Peggy? Well, Larry and Laurie, the house, of course, has been plagued with problems, insurance troubles, code violations, and a shortage of money. Well, now there is a plan, and it includes federal, state, and local dollars. We have a, a goal, which will include short-term help and long-term planning. The short-term help involves keeping the house for AIDS patients, but changing management. Then the remainder of the Good Samaritan Project can focus on things like counseling and client services and educational outreach and fundraising. And interestingly, one of the first groups of people that get approached are drag queens because drag queens are good at making money. You know, we're, we're part of the entertainment in the city. And they give to us, you know, the bars pay us, the audience gives us tips. And I know for me to give back, I have to give up stuff that I make by doing benefits and helping somebody else. So we get, and then we give. There was a troupe of drag queens that was founded in 1986 called the Kansas City Trollops that did nothing but raise money for the aid service organizations that were around. The first time I saw them, I just fell in love with them uh, because they were fun. And it wasn't about being glamorous. It was somebody needs help and this is what we can do. When I was in my 20s, these were 70 year old, 80 year old men uh, throwing on a, a wig that you know they found at a thrift store and their muumuu dresses or these crazy looking prom dresses 
big jewelry that, you know, you knew that all of this came from a thrift store. And they would get up there and they would pour their hearts into these songs to raise money. And they would stand up there and say, we are doing this for this person. This home needs help. And they've got our brothers and sisters there. And their tongues were quick and their wit was quick. And I learned a lot. Until a more effective drug or vaccine is found, the main weapon we have against the spread of AIDS is education. What we're really trying to do is how do you effectively increase the level of knowledge in people, reduce the fear level, reduce the rumor, misinformation, that type thing. I'm not exactly sure when I started with the Gay Talk hotline. It was somewhere in the early 80s. I heard about a conference being held out in Denver, a lesbian and gay health conference. It was at that meeting that I sort of associate the first mentions of safe sex. At the same time, the Gay Talk Hotline was getting more phone calls about AIDS, and it looked to me like we need to do more. And that's when we started the Condom Crusaders. Typically, we would go into a bar and be there for maybe an hour or two. I would frequently compare it to the old-time cigarette girls that the nightclubs used to have with their big box of cigarettes that they would walk around the, the clubs in. We would walk around with our boxes of condoms and lube and just try to get people interested. Everybody was always telling me, you shouldn't go out at night and you shouldn't go to these neighborhoods and things like that. And I had realized when I started going to the bars was that I was the people my family was afraid I was going to run into. One of the most powerful things is the gay clubs, open arms. Uh, Mr. Alvin Brooks stopped me in the parking lot of the uh, Linwood Shopping Center and he asked me would I like to attend a ad hoc monthly meeting. And I told him no. He said, why? And I said, aren't you all those fools that mark in front of drug houses? And he said, yes. I thought they were crazy. He asked me again a couple of months, and I left out a little part. A couple of times I read in the call paper and even in the store where they had marched in front of drug houses and actually shut those houses down. So it, that, that kind of impressed me. So when he asked me again, I said, yeah, I, you know, I'll come to the meeting. So one day, uh, Mr. Brooks <laughs> asked me, he said, we have a couple of uh, openings for board members. And would I be interested in it? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, you change your mind and, you know, then I, as a board member, found that they had applied for a grant for an HIV AIDS outreach program. I was the uh, program leader. The target population was teenagers, gay males, ladies of the evening, uh, prostitutes, you know, I don't like that word, but, and uh, IV drug users. Some people from CDC who came down and trained us of their program, they passed out needles. We had strong resistance against that here in Kansas City, but we were able to get around that. We went into crack houses, you know, we went into uh, drug dens, but we were out there and, and visible. So, you know, people, began to know who we were, you know, oh, that's ad hoc, you know. Hey, you got some of them colored condoms? And uh, then we started going into uh, the schools, which was another difficult problem because some of the school official was resistant to sharing with kids about uh, HIV and AIDS, but once we convinced them from information that we got from the health department that teenagers was having mad sex, they kind of start coming around. This is uh, Jeannie Zinn, and Jeannie is the coordinator of the Teen Hotline. Why a teen hotline for AIDS? Because teens can talk to teens. If they can talk their language, they can say it in their words, 
whereas an adult necessarily might not. A teen wouldn't necessarily call a hotline knowing that they're going to get an adult because they, ju they may judge them and they may not ask the question. They may feel guilty or feel like, oh, I better not do that. But if they know they're going to have a teen on the other line, they're going to get their answers. Anything shock you about that? About teens talking to yeah. teens? No, what shocks me is when I do AIDS education and I go out to the schools and the parents are saying, my God, don't talk to my daughter about sex. I'm not. I'm talking about saving her life. I went to high school at St. Teresa's Academy where we were required to do a service project. And I chose Good Samaritan Project. And when I talked with them, they said, you should really be working with the Teens Tap program. Another source of AIDS information in Kansas City has a national scope to it. It's called Teens Tap, or Teens Teaching AIDS Prevention. Close to 200 Kansas City youth volunteer to man this toll-free hotline. And that's actually where I started to get to know my buddy, Rob Black. And Rob was a wonderful person, a volunteer for Good Samaritan Project. He was a Teens Tap hotline supervisor and a very good one. Nobody really messed with him, you know, especially as a supervisor on the Teens Tap hotline. You felt like you had your leather daddy dad who was going to take care of things if someone got weird. Answering the phones felt good to be able to give correct information out about what we know and dispel some misinformation. But the speakers program started to grow as well. I was overwhelmed with speeches. I could not, and everybody that called wanted me. And I finally would say, okay, we'll be there. We tried to get uh, a teenager and a person with AIDS to go. The one engagement Rob and I went on to a high school in Independence, and they were not having a lot of it. They, they were yelling gay slurs. They were calling me names. Um, and of course, the staff was horrified. It was really disturbing. And we went back to Good Samaritan Project and we proclaimed it National Hug a Gay Man Day because I just felt that was the vitriol that was happening. I saw it. I saw it. You know, that was a period when people were just so fearful. Anyone that had, had AIDS, people were afraid to touch them. They were afraid to, you know, so there was, they didn't want to hug them. They didn't, didn't want them in the same room as them. They were afraid to, to use the same dishes. I had a client who, uh, his family, when they learned he had HIV, they put him out in the garage. They had a bed, they had blankets, and that's where he lived. And uh, I talked to the family. I said, why is he out here? Well, we don't want to get, we don't want, they had a baby. We don't want the baby to get sick. And they said, well, we'll get you some water. I said, no, I'll just take a little sip of his. I said, do you mind if I take a sip out of your, your glass? And uh, just, I was just showing them in my quiet way that uh, that's not the way you're going to get it. The last place people want to go and tell that they have AIDS or HIV is the church. It's the first question that they're going to be asked, how did you get it? Are you homosexual? Were you promiscuous? Are you on drugs? And I know this is out of fear because we want to believe that if we're not gay and if we're not out on the streets doing something wrong, we can't get it because we're in the church and we're good and we don't do stuff like that. And a lot of black people in the church do not believe that it's an epidemic because the people who have it don't come forward. When we started to engage with, with this, and we found the startling numbers of African-American new infections, African-American deaths, as opposed to our white counterparts, the question comes, well, how do you get information to that group? And we noticed that on any given Sunday, 70 to 80, maybe even more percent of uh, African Americans are attending somebody's church or they have some kind of relationship with with a congregation in their area uh, or, or within their family. Most people trust their pastor. They trust the information that comes from uh, the pulpit. And, and so we want to arm clergy with the 
correct information. Fred Phelps, the disbarred attorney from Topeka who was virulently anti-gay, picketed me personally five times. He accused me of writing things about lesbian and gay people that was sinful. He would send me faxes. I took it as a badge of honor because I knew that he was just absolutely dead wrong about all of this. That's how he got his start, was protesting at the funerals of people who had died of AIDS. Carrying their hate-filled signs at the funeral and sending uh, these hideous faxes to the funeral home and to the family. People are grieving. Family members and close friends are coming in to say goodbye to this loved one. And they were, you know, had their signs that everyone was going to hell. There were so many people who had so many compliments about Keith because of the worship through music that he created in the sanctuary every Sunday. After Keith passed, the youth choir said that they would never let Fred Phelps and his gang come to Keith's service. And I thought, what a wonderful thing for that generation, high school kids, to be so protective of him. It was a shining moment. During the Reconstruction time of our church in 1991, the congregation was invited to write on the walls. My son, he wrote a message. He said, thank you, Keith, for all you taught me in this house. Sorry, this always makes me cry. <laughs> Your music will always be heard here. I had this person, uh, his name was Rodney, and uh, he was a, a, a person that didn't have anybody coming to visit. He didn't have any uh, family members or any friends, and he just kind of kept to himself. I'd asked him one time, do you want to go to church with me? And he said, he just shook his head, yes. So I took him to church, and of course the church, you know, at that time they didn't accept people, but I didn't ask if I could bring him or not. I just took him in, <laughs> and they were very nice. If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to have a hard heart to accept people. Wherever they are, it doesn't make any difference. The disease was seen as sin. A disease can't be sin. Unfortunately, many of uh, our clergymen and women had people in their family that were perishing. It helped the discussion to start because it just wasn't isolated anymore to them. It was us. I had a great relationship with some of the funeral homes in, in town. This particular day, one of our good friends called and said, uh, Pastor, I got, I've got a big favor I need to ask. I said, sure, what's, what's up? He said, well, look, there's a kid that passed away, but when the, his pastor found out how he died, he refused to do the eulogy. He refused to allow the uh, service to go on in his church. I said, oh. I said, what, what's the deal? Well, he's, he died of AIDS. And, and the kid happened to be gay. And so that's two strikes, uh, according to this particular pastor, this particular church. And they wanted to know if I would do it. I met the young man's family. They showed open love to this, this gay kid. And at the time, it was kind of okay for fathers of gay black children to disown them. This family showed me so much, the way they embraced, the way they loved, the way they were compassionate to not only their son, but his friends. It was uh, life-changing. And in New York, the Harlem section of New York, there's a young lady, she's not young anymore like me. It's, uh, her name is Pernessa Seal. 
actually started this this program, realizing the same thing that we were struggling with, trying to get churches and pastors uh, involved. She came up with this thing called the Black Church Week of Prayer for the Healing of AIDS. It was very successful. They had a myriad of congregations that that uh, at March that that put on programs that rallied support and Kansas City was one out of eight major U.S. cities to try to replicate uh, that program and I, I want to say that we had the best national observation so I'll, I'll go ahead and say that we had the best <laughs> national observation of uh, of the week of prayers, a week of activities and uh, sessions and educational opportunities. They gave us opportunity to to just be there and to care. Those were actually the best years of my childhood. Was when my dad was alive. I had just turned eight, so I turned eight in March, and he passed in May. I did not realize he was sick until the very end because since I had spent most of my childhood in hospitals, I thought that's what everyone did. There was almost, just because of the times, two sides where he had this huge amount of friends within the gay community and the gay culture. And at the same time, he had all these friends from church and everywhere, no matter what type of community, he was like really loved. We were very, very close. It was, it was very hard for me. Um, I've had a tantrum at the graveside. Even now, I'll write him letters and leave them at his graveside, and it's been 30 years. Because I feel like he actually talked to me and understood me. Some people have that ability to actually listen to people and connect, and that's why he had so many friends. He often struggled, I feel, with the times and his sexuality and his own humanity. He has all these writings about what God did for him, and it was kind of interesting to see that with what the times were, how much he still was able to have that relationship, even when the world's views might have told him that he couldn't have that relationship. Sister Kevin Marie Flynn was uh, a nun who became very active, uh, I think through the Good Samaritan Project and, and other ways in AIDS work here. She was a gift of grace to us all. She was a, a, a sweet and gentle woman, but there was a core to her that was just rock solid. I started going to the house almost every day. And that's where I met a nun. Her name was Sister Kevin that would come every Thursday and cook. And they'd be laughing at the table. You would just think that you were serving a, a group of people that had the best of everything. They never talked about dying. They'd be telling jokes and around the table. That's what I used to notice more. And sometimes on my way home, you know, I would tears would come to my eyes to think about how, uh, how much the Lord had spared them of fear. Still, they were full of life, even when they had a disease that was taking their lives away from them. She was just not only very important to my buddy Rob, Rob, Rob Black, um, because he was Catholic and he very much connected with, with her. I remember I had one mother come to me at a meeting of some kind. She said, you know, I'm really jealous of you. I'm thinking, oh, why? I said, why? And she said, my son just talks about you all the time. Well, I knew why her son talked about me, because she didn't uh, accept him really as being gay or having AIDS. I think I was used a bit, but that was right in a nice way. <laughs> I was with her in the room when Mark passed, and I don't remember his last name at this point. I think um, there's a certain point where there was so much grief. So um, that was, uh, Hard to be there, but um, there was no one else in that room, you know, besides a, a kid on spring break from high school and Sister Kevin. And it, it felt important, it felt hopeful because he also chose to pass at that time. I know it.
they did nothing wrong. <laughs> you know, it wasn't because they were gay. It wasn't they were doing anything wrong, you know. And at that time, that was a very important point to get across. This was an illness that needed funding to figure out how to fix, you know. There was a lot of activity, a lot of grassroots action, all of these organizations being formed and staffed, and so many volunteers, so many helpers. It was heroes in the community who, who did what needed to be done to affect some change and to make people's lives and people's deaths a lot easier. We were at a wake, and uh, somebody came in with a little bit more alcohol than he should have. <laughs> the family member was there at the coffin, you know, and so he tried to push him away because he wanted to, to put his hand on the, on the corpse and talk out loud, you know, and so it was distracting everybody, I guess. And there was another sister with me, and she said to me, Sister Kevin, do you want to leave? I said, why? <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm Irish, and the Irish love to fight. <laughs> we love a good fight, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. 